Legends, I hope you're all fantastic. It's time for another installment of Friday Q&A. Thank you so much for this week's questions to everybody who chipped in. If you've got a question you would like me to answer on next week's Q&A video, just let me know in the comments. And if you're not comfortable asking me a question in the comments, you can always write to me, you know, get in touch with me on Instagram or any of my social media pages, which are linked in the video description. If you want some free IRs or you want to support the channel via my Patreon or by buying some music that I make, links are also in the video description. What else is going on? I feel like there was something else I had to talk about. Ah, oh, next weekend, I'm going to be down at the Western Australian Guitar Festival. I'll be doing a workshop on content creation for guitar players. And if all goes well, that will be live streaming on my page. So look out for that next, like probably Thursday night. If you're in the United States, it'll be Friday morning here in Australia. The usual Friday Q&A video will be up, but hopefully there'll be a nice little live stream from down there as well. And hopefully the weather's a bit better because at the moment, I don't know if you can hear outside, it's blowing a gale and it's raining and it's absolutely terrible, but that's just me. I hope the weather's a little bit better wherever you are. First question for this week is what's with that white Les Paul that's normally hanging on the wall? This white Les Paul, as you can see, <laughs> uh, I don't have the logo taped off anymore. I don't know, maybe some people are gonna get upset about the fact it's not taped off anymore. But this is a 2003 factory custom. It's got TV Jones humbucker size P90s in there. I love those. It's also got a little kind of Gretsch style uh, switch tip. Otherwise, everything on this guitar is stock. It's, I gotta admit, it's not a very good example uh, kind of finish wise of a Les Paul custom. There's so much kind of finish checking and the binding isn't flush with the rest of the body. And, you know, it's kind of funky, but it sounds really, really good. I really didn't like the way it sounded with the stock humbuckers in it. And because I've got, you know, a bunch of other guitars that I love the sound of with humbuckers, I thought this guitar would be really cool with P90s and these TV Jones pickups really kind of brought it to life. So uh, let's hear it. I'm using the Fractal Deluxe Reverb model at stock settings, one of my own IRs. I'm actually using two York Audio Room IRs with the uh, new full res stuff. I don't have an Axe FX Mark II. I've just loaded them into the scratch pad. There'll be a video about that coming up very soon. Uh, let's just hear bridge, middle and neck. <laughs> combo on there. This guitar kind of really likes stuff like Tube Screamer style pedals. I think this is the new Maxon OD808 model in the Fractal on the bridge pickup. <laughs> Loves it. It's really, really cool. There's a very good clean sounding Les Paul for cleaner stuff as well. And of course, P90s can get dirty with the best of them. So that's the white Les Paul Custom. Definitely needs a new set of strings. Might do that and bust it out for some demos over the coming month of October. All right, next question. Uh, do I like the band Pagan's Mind and their guitar player, Jorn Vigo? I think that's how you say his name. I must admit, I really, really do. And this made me go back and listen to some Pagan's Mind, their first two albums I have on CD. And I love Yorn's playing with Pagan's Mind. I also love his playing with Yorn Lande, which I've listened to a lot more. He is kind of one of those guys where, you know, I started listening to them and I was like, man, how's this guy getting the sound? And it was like a music man with a 5150. And he still has one of my favorite 5150 tones of all time. I think especially the Yorn Lande albums, um, those ones from like the mid 2000s, like the Duke, they sound awesome. And they were a very, very big influence on me as I was getting into recording and getting into bands. And uh, there's a kind of like majory sort of lick that he does that I think I stole for Rewind Your Mind. Like, you know, you do a major arpeggio. <laughs> Uh, that 
was a very, very terrible interpretation of that. Not the right sound for it, but uh, yeah, I remember transcribing something like that anyway, being like, that's a cool lick. Uh, he's kind of got those slippery Steve Vai style chops going on, but the uh, the mega chunk coming in there. Great band, great guitar player. Uh, go and check them out. What's my favorite vintage synth? You probably notice that there's a not so vintage synth right here. I'll tell you all about that. Uh, Maybe over the coming week, maybe over the coming fortnight, but yeah, I just bought a hardware synth and it's amazing. People who are on the Discord server know what it is. Uh, by the way, Discord server invite is linked in the video description. At the moment, my favorite kind of synth sounds are those like vintage Oberheim sounds, uh, like whatever it is on subdivisions, I assume it's an Oberheim on there, just that is probably like my favorite keyboard sound in the world. Uh, I do, of course, love the Blade Runner soundtrack and the CS80 stuff, but yeah, probably like an old Oberheim. I haven't really played a lot of vintage synths. I've been really lucky in my life to play a bunch of vintage guitars and amps, but not so much the synthesizers. So something like that, you know, like old Prophets or an old Jupiter or something like that, that kind of, uh, late 70s, early 80s vintage is what I would be all about, and kind of why I got this thing. A bunch of people will know what this is, so if you know what it is, just shout it out in the comments. Uh, riff leaks, this is an interesting one. Do I ever slip up and like play some new ragdoll material in demos? Uh, I don't think it's a slip up. I often do it really intentionally as well, and sometimes you'll hear kind of little mixes or demos or stuff like that with drums and bass that I just lifted straight out of the demos because I'm lazy and, you know, taking a chorus riff or something like that out of context to demo, I don't know what a Mark series amp sounds like versus a dual rectifier, I feel completely fine with. But yeah, whenever we get the chance to kind of finish up and tidy up that record and put it out, I'm sure a lot of people who watch all of my videos will be like, oh, that's what that riff is and that's what that one is. So uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's just the strategy. It's just leaking it all out. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of people probably noticed before we put out Follow the Leader that I played that riff a lot in a lot of the demo videos. And most people kind of rightly went, oh, is that a King's X riff or something like that? It's like, it's not, it's just, it's the oldie version of King's X. It's me ripping it off. So probably hear some more leaks of those songs as well. Uh, Firehouse, I feel like I've answered this question before. Firehouse, Bill Levity, really, really like them. To me, they are what you would get if you took like Rat and Bon Jovi and crossed them. And all she wrote is an absolute banger. So yeah, go and listen to Pagan's Mind and go and listen to Firehouse this weekend to get your guitar fix. Uh, the PV VTM, this one came up. Somebody was asking about Candlebox. There goes the cat. I don't know if you can see the little tail, but she's kind of walking around being a nuisance as always, a lovable nuisance, of course. What was I talking about? Uh, yeah, the very first time we went to the States, uh, the first show we played was in Oklahoma, at Rocklahoma, and a bunch of people came up to us and they were talking about this band Candlebox, who I had never heard of. They didn't make it over to Australia. And I don't think we sounded like Candlebox. I still don't think we sound like Candlebox, but uh, I could see where people were coming from, especially with Ryan's voice, and I think more so the way we play live. But I didn't know that was a PV VTM, and that is, that and the Laney AOR, I feel like uh, two amps I would love to try because I always see people talk about them. I feel like everybody knows about the Jose Modded Marshalls and the ADA MP1 and the Boogie stuff and the other things that were going around there. But I'd love to try one, love to try Laney AOR, would love to try some kind of Kitty Hawk preamp or something like that as well. Uh, they're things that I, you know, I've got a bunch of old guitar player magazines from the late 80s, early 90s, and I love reading the little ads and you see all these things. It's like, I've never seen one of those amps. I wonder if any even made it to Australia. Um, if anybody knows, how similar is the VTM to the Rockmaster though? Because I have a PV Rockmaster, awesome, awesome preamp. The gain on that is absolutely stellar. So uh, I know some of you out there know a lot more about PV amps than I do, or Laney amps, or just like everything in general. So please, if you do know something, let me know and uh, I can try and track one down. That would be awesome. All right, next question, Tyler Guitars, opinions. If you asked me 15 years ago what I thought about Tyler Guitars, I think it would be the stock. I don't like the headstock thing, but I kind of do like the headstock now. I, I like the whole burning water thing as well, that one. And if I'm correct, the 
James Tyler guitars that are made in Japan and made for the Japanese market are made at the Divisor factory. I think I'm remembering that correctly. And I got to tour that factory, uh, which was amazing when I went to Japan and got to see a bunch of those in various stages of completion. I got to play a few and uh, yeah, I think you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between one of those and uh, a real deal one. They're very, 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 very good guitars. Just one of those things where you kind of, you know, if you had your eyes closed and if you didn't like the head sock, you still had your eyes closed and played it, you'd be like, oh my God, this is the best strat I've ever played. So yeah, they're, uh, you know, they're right in the conversation, I think with Sir and a bunch of other brands for those like who just, who does the modern Fender thing better than anybody else. Although Fender kind of do the modern Fender thing pretty well as well. So uh, does the Axe FX3 have a 12 string simulation? Not something that you can just go turn the 12 string simulation on, but you can kind of fake it. I feel like there was a big pitch block update, maybe firmware 12 or something like that. And I did a video kind of dialing in a 12 string simulation. I want to say it was firm firmware 12.08, but don't quote me on that one. I actually don't know. Uh, but yeah, you can use the virtual capo set to an octave up and blend it in around 15 to 25%. And you get some nice chimey stuff on there. And that virtual capo tracks really, really well. So that little bit of detune on the voices, bit of chorus, and yeah, you can kind of get a decent enough sounding 12 string simulation. What's my favorite taco recipe? Depends. Am I making the tacos or am I eating the tacos? Uh, my favorite recipe that I make nearly every day is a breakfast taco. And what I do is there's these mission tortillas here called street tacos, and they are the best ones. They're amazing. If you're in Australia, you get them from everywhere, Coles, Woolies, whatever. And I will normally like fry up in a pan some chorizo and I will fry up some brown onion and as Americans would call it, bell pepper, or as, or as we call it here, capsicum. Although my wife's American, so I often call it bell pepper anyway. I'm confused, I don't know what to call it anymore. Uh, chuck all that in a pan with you know some seasoning of choice, normally some smoky paprika and some cumin and a few other good things like that, salt and pepper. Fry that up, then crack an egg and cook the egg to your liking. And then in the tortilla, you microwave it so that's nice and warm, you put some Kupi mayonnaise, the Japanese style of mayonnaise, you put all your stuff in there. Uh, you can add you know, a bit of coriander on the top or some pickled onions. I personally love the pickled onions. My wife's not so much into them. Uh, lucky there's not smell of vision because I basically smell like a pickled onion at all times because I love them so much. And then uh, Cholula hot sauce. And that is, that is the signature taco around this household. <sighs> I feel like tacos now. Maybe I'll make tacos for dinner as well. Sounds like a good good way to end the week. One last question for this week, and it's actually from the previous week. I can't believe that I wrote this question down and then I didn't answer it, but the general consensus is, uh, some of you know that I studied maths at uni. I have a degree in mathematics and mathematical statistics that I'm clearly putting to good use. But given that, how do I apply it to music or do I apply it to music knowing that, you know, there's probably some certain principles that I can get workable results a lot faster. And in answering this, I would say there's kind of two things. Uh, one thing that studying maths and especially very abstract types of maths uh, and, you know, pure mathematics, uh, whatever that is, like it was a ridiculous term when I was at university. I find it more and more ridiculous the older I get, pure anything, uh, just, yeah different discussion. Anyway, the point is uh, it kind of, I guess, kind of reorganized the way I thought about everything and looking at, I'm very interested in structural properties of stuff and things. <laughs> so looking at a, say a rock song and constructing it, the thing that often interests me is where do you have structures in there? You know, it could be the harmonic structure, the actual chords you're playing. It could be the way you're structuring your parts and letting them evolve and develop. It could be just, you know, the verse, chorus, bridge, guitar solo for 10 minutes, bridge, number two, outro kind of structure of a prog song or something like that. But that's normally the way I think about it. It's not normally, I don't like think of a guitar solo as like a kind of mathematical thing. Like, oh, if I play this, then it will work because I like exercising a more instinctual part of myself in those kind of things. If I'm playing a solo, a guitar solo is something where I actually mostly tune out 
and I just try to let feelings percolate up, whether it's like sadness or anger or extreme joy or something like that. It's it's almost like a form of meditation or something like that where I can sit and I can play guitar and I can actually remove my brain from trying to analyze everything and look for structures and look for patterns and kind of switch the math part of my brain off because I feel like most of the time I'm doing stuff, I'm always applying uh, some kind of, you know, thought system or I'm attempting to, I don't really know how good I do that, uh, that ultimately I've kind of thought of in a in an axiomatic, maybe mathematical sense. So yeah, there's my big long-winded answer for that. Uh, definitely, definitely studying maths taught me a lot of things that I can apply to music and other things in my life, but I kind of like playing rock guitar and metal guitar because I can just kind of switch that off and play instinctually and have a bunch of fun. So excellent question. Sorry I didn't answer it last week, but I eventually got to it. All right, I'm tuning out for this week. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend wherever you are. If you've got questions for next week, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from all of you. And uh, yeah, stay safe, be good to one another. See you all next week. (laughs) 